Uh, hello, everybody, and welcome. I'm here with James Arcadi. Um, James is a associate professor at Trinity Evangelical Divinity. Uh, assistant professor. Assistant, sorry. I, I get those. Yeah, I, th that's a distinction that matters. I forget that. Uh, and we'll, we'll have plenty of time to talk about distinctions that matter and don't matter uh, sure. during this conversation, but that one does. So uh, at uh, Trinity Evangelical Divinity School in, uh, in Illinois, and you are in uh, Old Testament or what biblical theology or yeah what? i mean uh, the, the department is the department of biblical and systematic theology and so mm -hmm. um yeah my my title is officially assistant professor of biblical and systematic theology but sure systematic theology that's kind of what i say that i do mm -hmm. and and do you teach classes in that um in in systematic theology or old testament or new testament or those sorts of things yeah, mostly systematic theology. So we kind of have a, a kind of a required sequence for the Master of Divinity or other master's degrees. We, we kind of go through all the loci of systematic theology. And then I'll teach some specialized electives every semester on, you know, uh, a, a specific doctrine or kind of a, you know, other specific area of systematic theology. So mm -hmm. all within those areas. All right. Well, cool. Um, I, I found out about James from um, Skylar McManus, who, who's been on my channel twice now. He interviewed uh, James for his blog. I'll, I'll link to that into, in the description. And it was specifically about this book, uh, uh, An Incarnation Model of the Eucharist. And um, I, I imagine this conversation sort of piggybacking off of the conversation I had with Brett Sockold that was uh, about the doctrine of transubstantiation and how that relates to the identity of Christ. And I think that's a, it's a particularly interesting subject and, mm -hmm. and James has written a really good book that dives right into all the nitty gritty about those sorts of questions. Um, but before we get going on that, I, I actually don't know James that well. Um, so I, I'd love to hear about you know, where you're from and, and sort of you know, how you came to be interested in these subjects and how you became to come to be a professor and those sorts of things too. Yeah, I mean, we can go uh, go way back. And um, I'm a Californian by, by birth and uh, spent, um, I guess it's a total of 27 years or so of my life in, in California. So born and raised in the suburbs of LA and um, uh, raised in a Christian home. Um, educationally, went to Biola University for my undergraduate studies, which is just about five minutes down the road from, from where I grew up. Um, and, um, yeah, and, uh, I suppose you were kind of asking about journey in some sense, being at Biola was my first sort of like foray into, into theology. Um, sure. My, Did you grow up in a pretty like evangelical sort of, uh, background? Yeah. Yeah. Evangelical. It was a, a Baptist church, but most churches in LA are kind of non-denominationally styled, you know, you can't really tell mm -hmm. the Methodist church from the Baptist church or or whatever. So yeah, broadly, broadly evangelical without too much distinctives as being that important uh, denominationally um, to me. So yeah. Um, but at, at Biola, I guess that's kind of where I started reading theology. I was a part of the, uh, the Great Books Honors Program there, the Tory Honors Institute. And that was the first time I think that I'd done any uh, reading of theology. And um, I guess for me, I just, I just found it really helpful. Like, you know, when I was thinking about God and thinking about my relationship with God, um, it was really helpful to read other people's thoughts about this and especially older, um, you know, older authors, you know, from the tradition, uh, the patristics, the medievals and, uh, and the like. Uh, and I found that they had really, really helpful things to, to say. Um, and so part of the impetus there is just to kind of keep studying, keep thinking about God mm -hmm. in conversation with these, uh, with these great thinkers. Um, so yeah, so that's kind of where it started there, I suppose, at, at Biola. Um, went to the East Coast then after, um, after Biola, did two years in LA doing some teaching, and then went to the East Coast to Gordon-Conwell Theological Seminary, where I did an MDiv and a THM, Master mm -hmm. of Theology. Um, sure, you know. I lived in Boston for, for two years. Um, did you really? Where and I you? went. I, I was getting my master's degree at Harvard uh -huh. um, in, in uh, statistics, nothing yeah. related to theology. But I went to Park Street Church, which was Did pastored yeah. by Gordon Hugenberger, who was, uh, I'm sure you know him if you went to Gordon Conwell. Well, and I took a course with him, actually. It was a January term course on, I think it was called, was it, uh, it wasn't Christ in the Old Testament. I think it was Old Testament survey, or maybe it was Christ in the Old Testament, something related to Genesis and the Old Testament and the like. And uh, yeah, the, the historic Park Street Church, which was mm -hmm. a beautiful place down there. Yeah. Were you down in Cambridge? Is that where you lived? 
I actually, we, my wife and I lived in Boston. We lived oh, within were? walking distance of Park Street Church and we so would walk, cool. walk there on Sundays. Yeah. Oh, that's great. Yeah. I mm -hmm. love Boston. So we ended up uh, being there for 10 years total, uh, my wife and I. And so my three kids were born in, in, on the North Shore up in Beverly. That's where we, we yeah. spent most of our time living. Mm -hmm. um, although we kind of were around the suburbs up there a little bit also. South Hamilton, uh, where Gordon Conwell is. Um, yeah, and I have very fond uh, memories and, and affections for uh, for New England and, and Boston in particular. Mm -hmm. So then you went from one North Shore to the other North Shore. Well, so um, actually, after after um, uh, being after finishing up my PhD through the University of Bristol, uh, which would have been 2015, I got a three year postdoc at Fuller Theological Seminary back out in LA. So it was LA to Boston, back to LA uh, mm -hmm. for three years. And I was part of the analytic theology um, project there at, at Fuller, um, which was a wonderful time. Great, great uh, team to be a part of. And you, know, you can't beat, uh, you know, reading and writing in the Southern California sun for, for three years. So that was awesome. And then it was here to the Midwest, to, uh, gotcha. to this, this shore. Yeah, the, this North Shore, whatever we call it. <laughs> this third, third coast, right? The third coast, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and so we've been here for um, uh, two years now, total, starting my third year, um, coming up here in the fall in a couple of weeks uh, at Trinity. Mm -hmm. Cool. And um, did, I, did I read online that you go to an Anglican church now? I do, yeah. Not only mm -hmm. do I go, but I actually serve. So I was ordained in the uh, Anglican Church in North America in 2007 as a deacon, and then 2010 um, as a priest. So coming up on uh, a decade of priestly ministry. Cool. And so served in, in different parishes when we were on the North Shore, um, served mostly at a church called Christ the Redeemer Anglican Church, which was in Danvers, right next to Beverly, mm -hmm. um, and uh, did stuff with college ministry there, uh, would preach on occasion, also did a little bit of like a circuit writing ministry where we kind of supply preaching at various parishes. Out in LA, I was at a parish called St. Luke's Anglican Church, then also did kind of a long-term supply at a smaller church down in the kind of the South Bay area near, near Long Beach. Um, and then presently, uh, we live in Wheaton, um, Illinois, so just uh, down the road from Trinity, and I serve at All Souls Anglican Church, um, just, you know, in an assisting capacity, and preach a couple times per semester, you know, do pastoral care stuff, meet with the clergy, strategizing, planning, that, that kind of a thing. So, yeah, so for me, it's always been really important to keep the, like, the, the, the practical and the academic together, you know, mm -hmm. the real rigorous intellectual theology with also just what's going on, you know, in the local church and, and how do we bring these things together and, um, and, and then they mutually, uh, you know, reinforce one another, you know, sometimes I'm trying to think like, well, how do I get these ideas that I'm having about the Eucharist or the Trinity or whatever, you know, to be applicable to people who don't have seminary degrees. Um, but sometimes it's the questions that come up, you know, from, from the congregation, from parishioners that sort of have pushed me to think uh, more deeply about these theological issues as well. So I find it to be a real great kind of um, synergy between, you know, academic work and, and parish work as well. Sure. So uh, I can imagine how if your theological uh, area of focus was the Eucharist, how that could lead one in a more sacramental uh, church direction. What, what was sort of, what sort of attracted you towards um, the Anglican church uh, away from sort of your Baptist upbringing? Um, yeah, it was, I think it was three things uh, mainly as I kind of look back on, on, on the narrative. Um, uh, for one, I think it was just doing some reading of church history. Um, and as I said before, just kind of finding a, a lot of help in reading church history, you know, finding patristics mm -hmm. or medievals or, or the reformers themselves really helpful. And that was not something that I'd, yeah, I got a whole lot in my upbringing. And I think I had a great church growing up and good Bible education. And I didn't really feel like I was uh, reacting too much against that. It's just, I felt like I was kind of finding something more. So as I was reading church history, it, it, it sort of was an impetus to, to find some traditions that were presently also in conversation with the, the broad tradition of the church a little bit more um, explicitly. So yeah, so kind of like, you know, reading, um, uh, you know, reading church history, reading theology was one impetus. Um, secondly was the Anglican um, uh, daily prayer cycle. So the daily office, morning and evening prayer. Um, that for me was really kind of eye-opening because there was, you know, I felt like kind of a lot of maybe 
maybe social pressure to have your quiet time, you know, when I was like in high school and yet I didn't quite feel like I knew quite what to do, you know, in my quiet time. And so when in college, I discovered the Anglicans had these, these services for morning and evening prayer with a, a, you know, a, a lectionary cycle, a cycle of readings you could do every day and a structure that just like made obvious sense to me once I kind of got my head around it. Um, that kind of personal piety component was also a real key draw towards the Anglican um, tradition. Um, and then thirdly was the aesthetics. So I just kind of found myself uh, attracted to uh, worship in a certain style with whatever, stained glass windows and altars and candles and hymns and incense, you know, kind of multi-sensory sort of an experience um, that was also really, really attractive. So sort of, sort of history and theology, personal piety and aesthetics were those three main attractions to the Anglican tradition. And sure. um, yeah, and thankfully my wife and I both were kind of drawn at the same time. Uh, she was raised Lutheran, but was more sort of Baptist in, in college or non-denominationally styled. Um, but we both sort of like found ourselves on the same path together, which was really, um, you know, reinforcing and encouraging for mutually encouraging for both of us to, to, to make that uh, transition or to find ourselves in that tradition. Mm -hmm. Sure, sure. Yeah. yeah, that makes sense. That this seems to be, it seems to be a relatively, not a huge trend, but something of it, but not a small trend either. Of, of a lot of people sort of our age raised uh, in vague uh, non-denominational evangelicalism getting a little bit more sacramentally minded and uh, whether it means going to Anglican or going, you know, sort of the full hog and going Catholic or Eastern Orthodox or something like that. There seems to be a decent amount of that. Yeah, it is a kind of a common story. Um, what was the uh, evangelicals on the Canterbury Tale, uh, on, the, on the Canterbury Trail, uh, said Robert Weber, that was what, like maybe early 90s or something like that. And then Tom Howard wrote Evangelicals Not Enough. I think that was 90s as well, or maybe I think that was 90s. So there's been sort of a trend uh, of that going on for, you know, decades, I suppose. And yeah, in some sense, I'm sort of just a statistic of evangelicals who discovered uh, Anglicanism and kind of fell in love with that. And especially in these parts in Wheaton, I mean, that's just, you know, we got C.S. Lewis is like the patron saint of the city, um, mm -hmm. you know, so it seems like there's, that, that happens quite a bit. Um, I've still been trying to wrap my head around Wheaton Anglicanism, which is its own sort of thing in comparison with <laughs> New England and West Coast Anglicanism. Um, sure. But it certainly is part of that kind of evangelical to Anglican sort of movement. Um, yeah. Although maybe that's not even the right way to say it, because I, I don't think of myself as like not being an evangelical. It's more sort of like what was drawn into something adding on to the evangelicalism that I had previously. Mm -hmm. um, so an augmentation, I might say, to kind of some of the core commitments that I found in evangelicalism that I was still attracted to and still still committed to. Yeah, sure, sure. That that makes sense. And you're you're obviously at an evangelical divinity school now. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And um honestly I, I would have thought maybe this is an old impression that I I I would have thought that it might not have been possible for an Anglican to be uh, uh, an assistant associate professor, assistant, uh, assistant shoot, uh, professor. Associate at, eventually, I hope. <laughs> at, at, at TEDS, um, uh, because like some of the stipulations around premillennialism, although I guess that changed recently. I, I, I don't know how that fits in with, with your story. Yeah, I, I mean, uh, I, I suppose, I, how do I say this? I had some of those same questions, I guess, when I was like interviewing. Um, mm -hmm. And yet the dean of TEDS, uh, Dr. Graham Cole, is an Anglican himself. He's an Anglican from Australia. Uh, he was, he, yeah, he, uh, Dr. Cole taught at TEDS for, uh, for a few years. And then he went down to Beeson Divinity School to become the Anglican professor of divinity at Beeson, which Beeson's, Beeson's a Baptist school. They have this Anglican chair there. Uh, then he came back to TEDS to be, uh, to be the dean. So all, all along, I sort of thought, well, well if, if the dean is an Anglican, then that obviously can't disqualify me as being an Anglican. And as I came to TEDS a couple of years ago, I've just been so refreshed and impressed by the, um, by the denominational and theological diversity on the faculty and, and among the students as well, yet really centered around the statement of faith. And I think when, when I look at the statement of faith, which is the statement of faith of the evangelical free church in America, um, 
I really find, uh, as they like to say, uh, you know, majoring on the essentials or focusing on the essentials and, and, and minoring on the, the inessentials. And um, there's a lot in that statement of faith that I think is, I mean, I, I sign on to it. I sign on to it without even squinting or anything like that. I think it's really solid. Mm -hmm. And I, I use that statement of faith quite a lot in teaching classes as kind of a pedagogical um, sort of device. Um, so, and, and so within my own department, within systematic theology, we have myself as an Anglican, we've got a uh, free church Baptist uh, systematician, we've got a Lutheran systematician, we had a Methodist, uh, Tom McCall, until he just got, got a new job at Asbury Seminary, where he's going to be a theologian in residence there, uh, which is a great move for him, a loss for us. Um, and then Presbyterian as well. So that, that's quite a diversity just within mm -hmm. systematic theology. And let alone, we have also diversity across the other departments uh, also. Um, so I, I, I find that really great to be in that kind of a denominationally diverse um, uh, environment. I think it creates good conversations. And I think, and I think students are, are telling us as well, it, it's, really, um, it's really nice to be able to reflect charitable disagreement, you know, which I think we, we so lack in the West, in North America, even within evangelicalism. So to be at a place where people can love each other and, you know, be friends and yet disagree theologically uh, is, is really a great place to be, I think. Yeah, well, amen. That, that's yeah. really one of my whole, goal, whole goals with this channel is uh, charitable disagreement, and, yeah. but, but not in a way that just sort of washes over the, the soft spots or ignores the hard questions, mm -hmm. but, but addresses them with, with seriousness um, and, and respect. And so I, that, I try to have a diverse uh, guest list, at least theologically diverse. And, and so I, I feel like that can be really helpful to get pushed on from different directions. Mm. Um, although the, the tricky thing is, is the, uh, you said, you know, majoring in the essentials and, and has, there's that famous quote. I'm, yeah, know, it's like minoring in the minors or whatever. Minoring in the minors. But the question is, is I'm one of the weird sort of people who disagrees about what the essentials are. And so that's, sure. that's where it gets a little bit tricky sometimes. Mm -hmm. um, but when it comes to your book, I thought that you had a really clear explanation in the beginning of the mm. different views of the Eucharist that have been taken, you know, throughout time in Christian history. Mm. And I, I just think way too few people know about that or have thought about that question seriously. So I would really appreciate it if you could kind of go through the spectrum that you lined out and the different sort of subspaces in that spectrum. Well, yeah, I mean, just kind of in preface, I, I think in some part, uh, this was one of these things that kind of emerged, you know, from conversations, maybe not necessarily with Anglicans, Anglican parishioners, but just other people, you know, who, who I chat with when I was in college or, or, or whatever, even in seminary, where a lot of evangelicals, I, I found, um, when they think about the Eucharist, they think either you have to have this like, you know, really low church, you know, uber Zwingli and, you know, beyond Zwingli kind of memorialist view, or you've got to have the Roman Catholic view of transubstantiation. And well, it can't be this, so I have to settle for this. That's kind of like the dichotomy that it seems yes. that a lot of people kind of fall into. Completely and, agree. Yeah. And, and part of what my, my hope in the first part of the book was just try to like, invite, you know, there's a lot of space in between those views there. And even for, for evangelicals, there's a lot of Protestant views in this in-between space in here, right, as well. So you don't have to do this like strict bifurcation. And so it's kind of an invitation, especially to maybe, you know, Protestant evangelicals to just explore, you know, our own tradition a bit more and find out, oh, you know, well, Luther's got a view that's not this view, and Calvin's got a view that's not this view, and Cranmer's got a view that's not, th there's, a, there's a number of, you know, points on the spectrum, as I kind of like to put it, um, that one can, um, you know, one can either choose or, or find themselves in or, you know, find even when they're within their own tradition that these points of um, points on the spectrum are, are open to them. So, yeah, that was kind of the, the, the impetus there in that chapter. And, and then also for those who, um, well, even if you don't have the spectrum in mind, but if you do kind of understand there's a whole variety of views out there, I also kind of wanted to put my view, which is not just my view, but you know, a view that I'm embracing here also on the spectrum so that you know, someone can kind of locate these kinds of things. Oh, it's kind of a quasi Lutheran view with some Orthodox tendencies, but not exactly, you know, that, that's mm -hmm. sort of a thing. So it's a sort of, um, yeah, locate my view on, on the map. Um, so yeah, that's kind of what was the impetus there or the, the driving sure. force of that chapter. 
Sure. And so, and, and so what, what, how would you, so it seems like there, there are the poles. There's Zwing, super Zwinglian, which is pretty common in America among evangelicals, which is, it's just a memorial thing and the symbols are just symbolic reflections. It's really not that different than say like, you know, saying that we eat turkey at Thanksgiving because the pilgrims also ate a turkey at Thanksgiving. And so therefore we're connecting to that memory, right? That, yeah. that's, sort of, that's sort of one end of the spectrum. It's almost like, you know, raise a glass to our fallen comrades sort of, <laughs> uh, sort of thing, uh, but a so, little bit. So my, my, uh, my, my professor at Biola when I was an undergrad, Dr. Fred Sanders, who's still at Biola, Trinitarian scholar, maybe mm -hmm. you read him, maybe you avoid him, I don't know, as a non-Trinitarian. Oh, um, I, I have a story, but maybe that's a different okay. time. <laughs> anyway, the, the, the slight tangent is one time he said that the, the Zwinglian view was like the bread and the wine are like flashcards for Jesus. You know, hold up the bread. Hey, you remember Jesus? Hold up the wine. Hey, you remember Jesus? And, and that's it. So flashcards for Jesus as the, uh, as the Zwinglian view or, or sort of an extreme Zwinglian view. And there's historical debate about how Zwingli, how Zwingli and Zwingli actually was. And that's, right. you know, I don't quite get into some of those, those areas. And I try at time, at least in the, in the chapter to be a bit more, um, uh, I suppose it'd be a bit more on the conceptual level. So my, my, my point is not to like settle historical disputes in there because, mm -hmm. you know, you ask five Calvinists what Calvin's view of the Eucharist is, you'll get six interpretations of Calvin's view of the Eucharist, what have you. So my point is not to like settle historical scholarship sure. on these various views, but more to kind of like introduce some conceptual space and then mm -hmm. link those up with some people who at least could be reasonably found to be in those areas. You know, so yeah. and I have this cute little, you know, I, I use some cities as like my yeah. <laughs> uh, demarcations on the map, you know, so we got the, the Zurich view is kind of the Bullinger and, and, and Zwingli view. The Geneva view is roughly a Calvinist, Bootser, Peter Martyr, Vermeilish kind of a view. Uh, the Canterbury view is like Thomas, uh, or, uh, yeah, Thomas Cranmer. Um, and uh, then we get to like Wittenberg and Nuremberg for Luther and Osiander and then finally Rome. Uh, gets us, you know, the various kind of official Roman Catholic views and, an, and a non-official Roman Catholic view. That's the kind of annihilationist view. That's the bread and wine get annihilated. And then, you know, the body and blood of Christ show up there. That's a, that's a heretical, but like within the, I mean, it's a, not conforming to the Roman Catholic uh, official theology. And yet, instead of conceptually, it's in that same, you know, within the city right. limits, you might say. <laughs> Right. So, so you, you, you skirted around some controversy of ascribing ideas to people by ascribing them to cities. Uh, yeah, that's, that's <laughs> partly true. Yeah. And so you'll see, oh, the Wittenberg view is kind of like a, you know, pop Luther view, that sort of yeah. thing or kind of, but, um, but my point is not to say this is Luther's view. My point is to say, hey, this is going to be sort of like familiar to those who are like in, you know, in the camp yeah. of like understanding Luther's view. But if it ends up being such, this is not exactly Luther's view, it's still a conceptually valid point on the spectrum. So just kind of go with me as I'm trying to like do a constructive project. And that's the main, I mean, the book is a constructive project. I mean, here is my view as I'm trying to like appropriate various principles from the church's tradition on what's going on in the Eucharist. Um, that's kind of my main goal. Again, settling historical disputes is not the goal, although I want to be historically sensitive in there. And I right. think hopefully we can you know, talk about that or, or you see that. And, in, and in the, the history is the source material for understanding these views, but but you're just sort of laying out kind of some of the main branches and streams in, in the theological landscape, not, yeah. not fighting over a, a particular person's, you know, words. And, and, and that makes some amount of sense. And I think that that's helpful. So there's sort of like Zwingli camp, right? Mm. Which is, it's symbolic, right? And, and you associate these things with memories of what happened, mm. uh, basically. And there's some diversity in there, but that's basically you know, one end of the spectrum. And then you have what's called sort of like the, and you, you call that the no non-normal or something like that. Uh, yeah, I've kind of gone back and forth on what the best terminology for that is. And I think I've used mm -hmm. different terms in, uh, in various publications. I mean, so I, as I kind of put in, in, in the book here and elsewhere, I sort of see three main families, yeah. um, three main families of views. And I sort of demarcate them based on what they say about the presence of Christ in the Eucharist. 
So if you go on, on, on one side, uh, you have what I call the corporeal presence views, a, a real bodily presence view. Uh, in, the, in the middle, what I call the pneumatic presence, more like a, a spiritual kind of presence. Mm -hmm. and, and one could mean that more like uh, Holy Spirit, capital S spirit, or also lowercase spirit S as well, because there's kind of different mm -hmm. ways of cashing out, especially some reform views. And then, and then the third view is, yeah, either no special presence or no non-normal presence or, you know, the kind of thing where Christ isn't any more in the bread and the wine than he is anywhere else if he has the attribute of omnipresence, which would mean, you know, Christ is present everywhere anyway. So, um, that, but presence is just not what's, what, what the focus is on that kind of, that, that view, the memorialist right. view or what have you, the, the, the memory, the cognitive um, activity, that's what's more the focus of that view. Mm -hmm. And and so so that that's really helpful and really interesting. Um, I so I I read uh, and you you told me before we started recording that you're reading Brett Sockold's Transubstantiation book. Yeah, and he sort of seems to be yeah. <laughs> it's a really good book. I, I felt like I learned a lot from that in it. I feel like it helped prepare me for reading your book, which is mm. perhaps even more detailed uh, mm. in some ways than his. Um, and so that because honestly before i had read his book and i had, i had actually heard him on a different podcast i had basically thought it's either some sort of quasi magical uh you know chemical change mm -hmm. or mm -hmm. or it's uh you know or it's memor just a pure memorial thing symbolic yeah. memorial thing and understanding the sort of kind of spiritual middle ground uh, was really helpful and i i feel like after reading your book, I couldn't help but feel that in retrospect, I was seeing that Brett was arguing that um, that Thomas Aquinas, you know, now I'm tempting you to argue about what actual historical people actually believed and taught, was something more of like the spiritual view or the pneumatic view than he often gets interpreted as being in like the the real, you know, substantially real camp. Yeah, and I don't know. It, you said you're still making your way through that book, but but I think that that's relatively early on. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. I mean, I'm not I'm not a Thomist, and I'm not a you know scholar of Thomas. Although I, I you know have a great appreciation for the angelic doctor and kind of borrow some of his conceptualization, especially when it comes to Christology in in the book itself. But what I put forward in there, so. Um, uh, so I would be interested to hear what, uh, you know, not being a Thomist, what other Thomists have to say mm -hmm. about how close one could bring uh, Thomas's view to someone like Calvin. Um, the, the Luther cell might be a little bit easier to make. Uh, I think the cell there is more just like Luther didn't quite understand all the implications of what he was saying. And so his view is really closer to Aquinas's or the Roman Catholic view than one thought. I mean, there are plenty of Lutherans that'll tell you, uh, and I even think that uh, Sockold make that, made that point there, that'll say like, hey, if you're going to err, err to Rome, not to Zurich, basically, yeah. is what some, you know, Lutherans will, will say. Is it Herman Sasse who wrote that book on, on Luther's, Christo or Luther's um, uh, Eucharistic theology? Um, so, and, and so on, on my sort of spectrum too, Lutheran views and Roman Catholic views are in this corporeal mode, you know, uh, family. So they're, they're, they're cousins in a way mm -hmm. that, um, you know, a Calvinist view or a Zwingli view are, are my more distant cousins because we're all, you know, we're Christians. Um, but you know what I mean? It's, 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 a, it's, a, it's a separate lineage, you might say. So I'm not, so I'm making that connection between, say, this family and that family seemed a little bit of a harder sell to make in, in my own mind. Now, there was a great, uh, interesting, provocative article that Richard Cross, who's at Notre Dame, wrote um, a number of years back that I only kind of referenced briefly in my, in my book, where he was trying to do something similar in that um, uh, to make a point of contact between Roman Catholic, Lutheran, and Calvinist views having to do with action at a distance. And uh, there's a bit of action at a distance going on in, in my book as well. Um, so, so he saw more of like, if you understand, from what I recall, the essay, uh, it's in uh, uh, International Journal of Systematic Theology, 99 maybe, maybe early 2000s. Um, yeah, I think it was sort of, if you just kind of accept that immediate action at a distance is possible, then you can sort of like 
wrap up a reformed view or a Calvinist view in with basically what Thomas was saying about um, you know the distinction between certain kinds of, of presences. Um, I'm, I'm not so certain about that. And also I'm not so certain about giving up the bread and the wine. Um, so for me, that's the real kind of like sticking point, uh, I think, where my view uh, or the, the impanation view is uh, the incarnational model of the Eucharist distinguishes itself from a Roman Catholic view, even as much as both will want to say, as with the Lutheran, um, you know, that object right there that we're pointing to, you know, that's the body of Christ. Mm -hmm. and that's, and, you know, as you read the book, I mean, that's, that's kind of where I start is, is from the linguistic perspective. Like we've got yeah. this utterance here in scripture. We have this utterance in, in the liturgy, you know, I, mm -hmm. I, I take a piece of bread and I hand it to somebody and I say the body of Christ. And that's a real predication to use that uh, terminology from George Hunsinger that's happening there. Um, I'm trying to read that as, as, as simply and as surfacely as, as possible and, um, and try to make sense of that. And it seems as though, from my view, Roman Catholic, the Lutheran are, are, are similarly trying to take that just at, at face value, but they've got different ways of explaining that and also then different things to say about whether or not it's bread or wine. So mm -hmm. on my view, I, would, I could hand this to you, <laughs> hand the object and I can say the body of Christ. And I can also say, a piece of bread, which yeah. the Roman Catholic is not, as far as I understand, not being Roman Catholic, is not able to say that as, as specifically because you're just referring to the accidents and, and that sort of a thing, but it's not a substantial predication in the way that first utterance is. Right. There, there's no longer bread to be talked about. That's uh, correct. Yeah. As far as I understand. Not, and yeah, and, and Brett, I was a little bit on either side of that. I, I wasn't quite sure, but so... One thing that I think is an interesting question is as far as I can tell in the early church, this really wasn't a subject that was debated that much, right? Like in the fourth century, the Trinity was argued about like to no end, you know, with, you know, a huge number of councils and bloody street battles and all sorts of, you know, ugly stuff, right? It was just an absolutely you know, uh, gut-wrenching theological conflict, probably like the church has never really seen since. But the, as far as I could tell, you don't have like church fathers arguing with each other about the, the meaning or the definitions of the Eucharist. You have them explain it, but most of the time, if they're explaining it, they'll be like, well, the Roman, the pagan Romans misunderstand us. They think we're being cannibals. Here's why we're not being cannibals, right? Uh, and maybe the Gnostics would do some weird things like, you know, put some dye in to make it look like blood or, or something like that. And they would say that, that you shouldn't do things like that. But as far as even like within, like between the Arians and the Nicaeans, as far as I know, there was no argument about the definition of the Eucharist and how to do it and what it meant and stuff like that. But yet, once you get to the late Middle Ages and then especially right at the Protestant Reformation, it's like this huge hot area of conflict. And I think a lot of modern day Protestants don't really understand how much the, the Protestant Reformation was over questions of the Eucharist, in addition to being about, you know, soteriology and stuff like that. We think modern day evangelicals think, well, it's all about faith versus, uh, you know, grace uh, alone uh, versus works, uh, salvation and stuff like that. But really a huge, huge question, almost a bigger question was the Eucharist. So why, why in the 15th and 16th centuries was this a big question? And why wasn't it a big question earlier, if you had to say? Okay, a lot going on there. Let me uh, make a couple comments. Um, first on kind of like the, the more latter thing you were saying about the, just the height of controversy in the Reformation, which I think is, is right. And I think uh, it's, a, it's a narrative we don't often get in Protestantism and, and evangelicalism and specifically. But when, when you think about it, I mean, um, you know, what was the issue such that Luther and Zwingli couldn't get on the same page? It was the Eucharist. I mean, you think about 15 teens or whatever, they're saying very similar things about the authority of Rome. They're saying very similar things about scripture and et cetera. And, you know, they come together at the Mark Berg colloquy and like, well, let's just kind of, you know, figure out our differences. Was that 1521 or so right around there? I'm not and, quite sure. And but... It's, but it's the Eucharist that, that they, they can't 
they can't agree on. Okay, so mm -hmm. that, that's right at the height there. And then one of my heroes, Thomas Cranmer, um, he, he gets executed for his views on the Eucharist. It's not justification. It's not even having to do with papal authority uh, fundamentally. It is the confession on the Eucharist. That's what gets him martyred, I would, I would say. Um, and so this is, this is, you know, right at the core. And now there's issue, I mean, not to downplay what's going on with justification by faith alone and, and the authority of scripture and the authority of, uh, of the Pope and, and what have you. Those are all, you know, part of this, part of this mix and part of this milieu. And I don't think you can even really clearly, neatly tease these issues apart in, in this, you know, crazy 16th century. Um, but if we ignore the sacramental Eucharistic um, controversies and just focus in on issues of justification, then I think we're, we're missing a good chunk of the story. Now, back to the earlier claims as well, in terms of controversies um, in uh, prior to that period, um, I don't know. I mean, you know, any, any student of church, church history, I'm, I'm sure you know that a lot of theological clarification takes place in the fires of, you know, controversy. And, and you yeah. know, someone says something and someone's like, that doesn't sound right, <laughs> yeah. you know, and then you got to have, you get, you know, you got to, you got to duke it out a little bit or you got to kind of figure it out or you got to call a council together or what have you. So from that sort of perspective, it doesn't seem as though there was clearly the need for an ecumenical council to talk about, you know, Christ's presence in the Eucharist or what have you. There is, I think, a diversity of views present in the patristic period. So I'm, I'm one who sees kind of like a, I don't know, fertile seedbed of perspectives on Eucharistic theology within the early church. Sometimes you get these narratives either from Protestants or Roman Catholics that like, you know, voom, there's only one view on the Eucharist that's been the consistent view through all time and my opponent is the wrong one. You know, like, yeah, yeah. I, I think, you know, there's, there's a fair amount of diversity and there's a fair amount of, um, uh, what's the, it's sort of like above the fray or above, you know, it's a little bit more abstract. They weren't asking a question as specifically as what yeah. are the metaphysics required in order for this object to be the body of Christ. So that's why in my historical section in chapter six, I'm more just trying to like say, you know, point to places where there are similar things being said. You know, the incarnation is being used as a motif to talk about Christ's presence in the Eucharist, or um, this object here is being referred to both as the body of Christ and as a piece of bread and, and, and that sort of thing, just to show that there are some dovetails with these kind of traditional positions uh, or patristic positions that aren't just, um, you know, I'm not just making this up right now. Now we do get controversies in the eighth and ninth century, and I think Sockold mentioned that as well in his book uh, with the um, uh, uh, one of those fellows at that uh, monastery. What are they? Retraminus and, and his yeah. uh, his friend, what have you? Radbirds, Radbirdus. I always get those names confused. So there was controversies there, and there was and there's the Berengar controversy as well, which Sockold makes much of, and I uh, you know refer to the. Um, uh, Ego Berengarius in my book as well is another confession that needs to be made um, also. Um, it, it, from what we can tell in the history, it doesn't seem that there was a huge impetus why Innocent III needed to proclaim the term transubstantiation at the uh, Lateran IV as like the way to think about things, but you know, he did. And various uh, medieval scholar, medieval uh, schoolmen like Aquinas, what have you, kind of took that term and expounded upon it and, and made it specific and detailed. Um, we shouldn't though forget about the, the, um, the Hussite and Wycliffe, Wick, Wycliffeite, Wick, yeah. Wycliffe the followers I'm, of Wycliffe uh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> and the Lollards and their objections as well. So in some ways, um, you know, Wycliffe has held it up as the morning star of the Reformation. And, and his views on the Eucharist, I think, are in some ways fairly similar to some of the things I'm talking about here. I didn't go into him in the, in, in the book. Um, but, you know, it was, it was the uh, Council of Constance, the Roman Catholic Council of Constance, which was 1418, I think. So two, you know, 100 years before, um, uh, before Luther and, and what have you. Uh, you know, that's, that's the council at which uh, Jan Hus was, was condemned and then killed. Um, because of his views on the Eucharist. That was the council that also dug up Wycliffe's bones and then burned them and then <laughs> sprinkled them out in the, in, in the river because of his views on the Eucharist as well. So I mean, those were the issues at that particular council that, had, that, that got those two theologians, one previously deceased and then one uh, killed, um, uh, you know, condemned. So 
you know, it's been a perennially uh, challenging issue, um, mm. but at different times and in different places and for different reasons, you might say, does the controversy, you know, sort of uh, arise, I guess. Now today, I don't, you know, no one's getting burnt at the stake so far as I know for the Eucharistic yeah. views. And I, I think I'm glad about that, you know. I, if I I'm, written... I'm near the top of the list of people glad that people don't get burnt at the stake anymore. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, sure. So, I mean, uh, if, I were, if I were writing this book at a certain time in a certain place, you know, it, it would get me, it would at least get, the book would be banned. <laughs> you know, it'd be officially on some uh, banned list or what have you, and it might get me, uh, you know, imprisoned or tortured or what have you. So I'm glad that's not happening right now. Um, have we swung too far to another side where like no one cares about it and no one talks about it and no one thinks about it? Um, I don't know. I think you mentioned yourself that, you you know, people think about this and, you know, your, your conversation with uh, Sockle was, was, was uh, you know, people are interested in that sort of a thing. And I find that the case too. And I talked to some of my students, you know, these are seminarians coming from Baptistic, non-denominational, free church, Presbyterian um, uh, traditions as well. And they're kind of interested, they're, they're kind of intrigued. Um, but I think, as we talked about before, they kind of have this bifurcation narrative. And so this kind of invitation to think more in a more nuanced fashion, both historically as well as, uh, you know, theologically, I think is something that's really attractive to a lot of people. Hopefully this won't bubble up into, you know, burning kind of uh, controversy, literally burning controversies, yeah. um, but a, a little controversy we could, we could deal with. Right. And we're, we're living in a very nice age of the church. Um, I think, like, for those of us who, who read a lot of church history, it's hard to think of a time when the various denominations or various branches got along as well mm -hmm. as they do now. And were capable of, um, you know, having difficult dialogues without uh, the stakes being imprisonment, man banishment, uh, burning, you know, uh, posthumous burning, and uh, all the other sorts of things that have happened. So I, I guess that's something to be thankful for, and and hopefully uh, we we use that for for good things and for good constructive dialogue and good constructive theology, and not for bad. But yeah. uh, but I, I think that is something uh, to be thankful for. So I think. I think now would be a good time to go into more detail on sure. the view that you explain and you uh, are a proponent of in, in your book and exactly how you think this whole uh, Eucharist works out. I think we've laid a good background. We've kind of laid out the spectrum of views and we've covered a decent amount of the history of the topic. So, so how do you think that, that we should understand this today in a way that makes sense? Yeah, sure. Um, I mean, I think the kind of the, I don't know, the easiest entry into thinking about this is, as I said earlier, you, you've got this sentence, you've got this predication in scripture, in our liturgical worship, where Christ refers, uh, I think very clearly on the surface, uh, <laughs> to a piece of bread as his body. And you know, he holds it at Last Supper, he holds up a piece of, piece of bread, draws his disciples' attention to it, and he says, this is my body. And likewise, he takes a cup of wine, and he says, this is my blood. And those, you know, those sentences there are the, the starting point, I think, for the exploration. Because you could ask, uh, the follow-up question is like, well, that's weird. What does that mean? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you know, like, how's that supposed to work there, Jesus? It looks like bread, <laughs> you know, looks like wine, tastes like wine, smells like bread. Like, what's going on with that? Um, and I do a fair amount in the book to kind of like try to put that in their context and kind of like talk a bit kind of more in a biblical theological fashion about how presence issues might be at play in the Last Supper. You think about Jesus going away from his disciples. This is the, the John narratives, John 14 to 17 or so. This is kind of like prepping the disciples for Jesus going away. And so his like leaving them, leaving, uh, not going to be present with them. And yet I think that kind of primes the, our, our intuitional pump for something like a, uh, an indication that there might be some other way that Jesus will be continuing to be with his uh, disciples. Uh, I think the road to Emmaus story as well is another one of those things that kind of circles in around things. You know, I, I don't know why I had missed that before, but I had never really thought of the road to Emmaus story as a story that's relevant to the Eucharist. But obviously i guess it is but but that was something reading your book i was like man why had i never really noticed or thought to think of it that way before but 
Yeah, um, you know, and some don't take that reading, of course. Um, so that maybe that's you know, you're not you're not alone and not and not seeing that. I think it has been more of a traditional read to see that. And then what I did in the book was kind of like compare some of the verbs and some of the terminology between the kind of standard account, especially the Lucan account, uh, as well as the the Emmaus um, narrative. You know, taking blessing, breaking, giving. This is kind of a standard sort of uh, Eucharistic action that that goes on there which I think is what takes place there in, in Emmaus. And then, you know, and then Jesus vanishes from their sight and, and what have you. And, um, you know, the, the traditional position is like, well, he doesn't need to be with them anymore. Visually, he's with them there sacramentally, or he's with them there in the bread and, and the wine. So kind of like circling out from that. And in, in the book, I do some other things on, on the doctrine of omnipresence and looking at kind of like holiness and how holy places can be considered a concentration of divine activity, which divine activity is also divine presence, which again is more just sort of kind of creating this like uh, kind of this, this intellectual milieu or conceptual milieu for thinking about why we might think of the bread and the wine as a concentration of Christ's presence. Mm -hmm. uh, and a concentration of a human's presence is their, their bodies, you know, their, their bodies and, and their blood, their, their blood as well. Um, so that, that, that kind of like creates this kind of section there, but then we still have this sentence, right? We still have, this is the body of, this is my body, this is the body of Christ, or this is my blood as well. Um, and then a, a traditional move is to say, well, well, look, we have some, a similar predication in Christology. Uh, and for traditional Orthodox Christology, you know, you refer to Christ, you say, this is God. But you can also say, this is a human being. And that's what the Chalcedonian definition, so far as I understand it, was trying to articulate as robustly as possible, that both those sentences, this is God, this is a human being, are apt of the one person, Jesus Christ, in virtue of his two natures. So like you have these two predications here of one person, so too then do you, might you be able to go down the, the direction of saying, well, this object too might have two apt predications of it. The body of Christ and and bread, and then of course I you know lo and behold the incarnation has been used as a motif for talking about the Eucharist throughout the course of church history. So that was kind of again chapter six where I say I'm not just making this up. You know, lots of people have said this sort of a thing um, from the patristics on through to the to the last century, um, where I talked about Sergei uh, Bulgakov, uh, Orthodox theologian, um, as well as medievals and Anglican you know figure uh, also. Um, so once we kind of get that, at least as I'm kind of building the case, you know, going from mm -hmm. biblical, a bit more historical to the Christological, then it, for me, it becomes like, well, how much more, you know, how much more can we do in terms of explanation? And that's where I really use a lot of the more contemporary discussion in Christology, especially analytic theology's discussion of Christology, to get more specific on the nature of the unions between the human nature and the, um, uh, and the divine nature. And then try to appropriate some discussion of, of, of uh, appropriate that discussion for talking about how it is that this bread can be incorporated into the body of Christ, such that that sentence becomes apt. That sentence is, is comes out as as true that this is the body of Christ. Mm -hmm. and that's where we jump into the extended mind literature. We do philosophy of mind and metaphysics and all this kind of fun stuff as well. Right, right, and and so and this is where I probably will want to push you a little bit. Um, mm -hmm. And so um, I guess, you know, this is something that Sokol and I talked about, right? And I, you can't put the Eucharistic bread or wine under a microscope and see evidence that it is, that Jesus is somehow present, right? Sure. There is something non-positivistic, you might say, are, are non, um, well, it's non, not empirical, right? Non empirical, yeah, about, about what's going on, mm -hmm. right? Uh, mm -hmm. you, you know, there's no, there's no scientific experiment that you could do that could inform you mm -hmm. of Jesus's presence, yeah. So, I guess, in what sense then do we know? I guess that's sort of this is, a, I guess, an epistemological question. Mm. How do we know? that it is the body and blood of Jesus? Well, if you're asking an epistemological question, then I think we know by faith. Right. And we trust, you know, the, I mean, this is very Lutheran. You just trust the word of promise that was given to us in scripture, 
uh, we can we can trust the testimony of the church. We can trust even our own, you know, inner witness of the Holy Spirit that might corroborate these kinds of things as well. But this kind of knowledge, I mean, this is a, this is supernatural knowledge. It's faith. There's nothing right. naturally knowable about um, this object being uh, the body of Christ. Just in the same way, you know, you could take Jesus's actual body in first century Palestine and put it under a microscope. You're not going to find divinity so far as I understand things. You know, you're going to see a human body just right there. And mm -hmm. plenty of people saw Jesus and they're like, that's just some dude, you know, like whatever, like, you know, but, but by faith, we say that's God. And that right. is a and significant so, confession. So there are two, there are two senses in which my, my question kind of makes sense, right? How do we know? And there's sort of the, as a partaker, how do we experience or know the presence, mm. right? Mm. You know, how, how can we know? Well, we could connect it back to scripture and revelation and church authority and stuff like that, right? That, but that's not exactly how we know while we're participating, mm. I think. And so, so that, how, how are we supposed to experience mm. or know in that sense? Yeah, sure. I, I get what you're saying. Um, so it's more a matter of like, you know, I get this piece of bread handed to me and, you know, the minister tells me this is the body of Christ. And I know that's a scriptural sentence and I know that's a, a, a traditional theological sentence. And I might just, and I might say, amen, you know, it is true. This is the body of Christ. But I might be still like, but that's weird. <laughs> yeah. You know, what's up with that? That's kind of the, the driving question, honestly, of my research. That's weird. What's, what's up with that? Um, and this is where I this is where I want to say, well, here's a way to understand this that's not crazy, it's not nonsensical, it's not impossible. And I think Sokol even talks about this a little bit as well. Um, uh, maybe it's the uh, the impossibility of transubstantiation that's at, in, in his target. But I think someone might say, you know, that can't be the, a human body. That's impossible. That's a piece of bread. And so you know, the, the defender of the faith or what have you, the one who wants to articulate for a traditional position can say, well, no, no, it's, it's not impossible. Uh, it's not impossible. And here are some reasons why we can think of it as not being impossible. Um, now, I, I tend to like lean on the incarnation in terms of like possibility and impossibility and, and that sort of thing. So mm -hmm. um, I think that it's possible that Christ became, that, that the second person of the Trinity, the, the word became incarnate in the person uh, uh, or in, in Jesus Christ of Nazareth as, the, as his human nature. Um, and I take Chalcedonian Christology to be kind of a bedrock. Um, if one thought that was impossible, then I might think that you don't really have much of a, a stream to go down towards thinking about the Eucharist, at least not on, on my view. Now, maybe God could make it such that this piece of bread was also a human body. Um, but I kind of think if one didn't have a prior commitment to the divinity and humanity of Christ, one really wouldn't go down that route. Maybe one right. would, I'm not sure, but maybe, maybe um, but I, I have less inclined to think that that, that one would uh, go down that route. Um, so anyway, so that's to say, uh, to, to kind of lean on this prior commitment of the incarnation being not just possible, but also actual, and that being a bit a, a, at the core of the Christian confession, or so I think at least, um, that is, um, once we kind of have that up and running, then we can sort of take that as well into using that to explain how it is that this object right here might be bred as you're seeing it, you know, empirically, tasting, touching, smelling, et cetera, digesting, that's all true. That doesn't need to be denied as, at all. But like the incarnation is the uh, assumption or the you know conjunction, uh, the assumption of a human nature and the divine nature. So too might the Eucharist be the you know the conjunction that the I'd say adding on. That's that's kind of the opposite of assuming. But right, right. It's similar, it's it's an opposite metaphor in a sense. And, and so in a similar fashion, I want to say you don't need to deny anything about what you're seeing and experiencing there. Yeah, that's totally a piece of bread. Just like when you saw Jesus, you don't need to deny anything about his humanity. Totally a human being. But also the confession of faith is that human being is also the second person of the Trinity, the divine word. And this object right here, yeah, a piece of bread and also the body, you know, it's the body of Christ, um, you know, the, the ascended and risen Lord. 
so that's kind of, I mean, I'm not quite sure if I got, how did I got to that point? In no, this no, I, I, but, I'm following your train of thought. So, yeah. so I guess I'll, I'll switch to focusing on the incarnation a little bit, and then maybe sure. we can circle that back to the Eucharist. So yeah. a, as someone who denies the, tr the traditional doctrine of the incarnation, um, that, the, I guess that's part of why your proposal doesn't do as much easy work for me, hmm. I, I guess, as it might do for someone else. But I could see how piggybacking off of that makes sense. But for me, when, when I think about the incarnation as it's traditionally taught or, well, even that, so like I, I would argue that even within orthodoxy, the tradition has changed and slipped around a little bit over the ages. And it's a little bit differently understood now than maybe it was in Athanasius. But then again, you might talk to someone who's really good at reproducing Ath Anyways, it's complicated. But so it seems to me like I don't understand in a modern sense what most people mean by the incarnation anymore. Hmm. And that it's like I can get into the thought mind of, you know, Athanasius or Cyril of Alexandria or whoever. Um, but it's like that's an imaginary exercise. And when I'm actually talking about or debating about the doctrine sort of in modern parlance, hmm. I, it almost doesn't really seem to work anymore. Hmm. Because I, I guess the question is, if so if Jesus is a fully human person and he has a fully human mind and he has fully human DNA and internal organs, and if I could do a brain scan and not notice any anomalies, then in what, in what sense, in what plane of reality are we talking about when we say there's something else going on? And what exactly are we saying is going on, I guess is the way that I would phrase the question. Yeah, so I guess, I mean, first off, I, w I wouldn't say he's a human person. I'd say he's a divine person with mm. a human nature, because I'd yeah. want to take a traditional view that there's only one person, um, but two natures, so to avoid the Nestorian sort of claim there. Um, but, I mean, is your question, how is, like, what, how is that guy? Yeah, well, so, so what's, what's the difference? Yeah, so, like, in what sense was, was, was Jesus God, and how is he different than John the Baptist in that sense, and, and how do we know? Yeah, well, you you keep going the epistemological question there. Maybe right. We'll save or, that one for, sorry. Yeah. For, yeah. For for, for, uh, uh, for a second there. Um, so I mean, I guess I take it that, and you can kind of cash this out in different ways. And I think again, the contemporary analytic theology uh, conversation has has done so. And maybe you spoke with Skyler about this a little bit because I know he's kind of up on on some of that mm. literature uh, as well. Um, so you might just say that um, on a kind of well, I guess you could take a more abstractist view and say, whatever properties are necessary and sufficient for being a member of a certain kind, Christ has those for two kinds. Mm -hmm. So, and the kinds being divinity and humanity. So if someone has all the properties necessary and sufficient for being human, they are human. If someone has the properties, all the properties necessary and sufficient for being divine, they are divine. If one has both sets of those properties, then one is human and divine. Now that's that kind of a, what's kind of called an abstractist view where you kind of like layer up various properties and then kind of like you come to an individual. Yeah. I'm not quite sure yeah. that's the best way of going about doing those sorts of things. Well, that and that'll run into pretty serious problems when Jesus doesn't know things or when Jesus gets tempted or when Jesus dies, right? Because it would seem to negate one category at the expense of the other, not just be like the overlap of the Venn diagram or something. Right. And so my worry is that if you have one property doing uh, double duty, uh, then you don't have a fully human or fully divine nature. So I tend to think that of, you know, uh, uh, right. So, yeah. So I tend to think of, uh, you know, natures as kind of like a set of capacity and power, set of capacities and powers. These are kind of like the abilities that endow a, a holder of that nature to do certain kinds of things. And I mean, kind there is like a specific in a specific way. And so, you know, one capacity and power that human nature seems to possess or that possessors of the human nature have in virtue of their nature is something like rationality um, or the ability to will or love or what have you. Um, the divine nature has that also, but it has a divine capacity to do that, not a human capacity to do that. So I don't think that there's just like a generic capacity for reason 
Rather, there are, there's a capacity for human reason that humans have, there's capacity for divine reason that divine persons have, and et cetera, for other kinds of like related views. Now, there are also capacities and powers that a human nature uh, endows a, a holder with that the divine nature doesn't have. I mean, the, a human nature has a body, you know, has mm -hmm. a tongue. You know, I can, I can taste my tea in the morning that I think a divine person can't do qua divine person. Um, mm -hmm. So, uh, so that's, not, I mean, that's, not a, that's not a limitation on the divine nature that God can't do something that he is not particular to. It's a logical impossibility. Kind. Yeah. Yeah, well, it's just like, you know, you don't get down on, uh, I don't know, you don't get down on the, the, the lion for not being able to, like, dr uh, breathe underwater like a shark, because lions don't do that. <laughs> you know, that's not, that's not a diminishment of lion nature that it can't breathe underwater. It's just like, well, lions don't do that kind of a thing. So it's not a diminishment of divine nature that God can't taste tea, because divine beings don't do that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. Now, what, what you get, though, I think what's really exciting, at least I think, <laughs> in the incarnation, is you get one of these divine persons that has all the capacity and powers for being a divine person that assumes or takes on a human nature, which includes all these capacities and powers, some of which are similar or related, and some of which are very different. And so now, all of a sudden, this divine person has two sets of natures, two sets of capacities and powers by which the divine person can, you know, engage with the world so to speak mm -hmm. and so not only so you wouldn't second... you wouldn't hold any sort of empty kenosis or anything like that where where something gets left behind in that process i don't mm -hmm. um i know others do and that's a debated topic right there but it it seems to me that um it's more preferable to hold that the second person of the trinity maintained all of his divine capacities and powers while adding on a second nature, a, a second set of capacities and powers and what have you. And that he was able to operate in and through those different natures, uh, you know, in different ways. So you ask, you know, the sun doesn't know the time or the hour or what have you. It's an expression of ignorance. Well, you know, my view would be like, yeah, humanly, he didn't know the time or the hour. Divinely, in virtue of omniscience, you know, he knew the time and the hour, and that was a sufficient thing to, to, to know for a human being, for a, for a divine person, for a divine being. So or likewise on like something like, um, you know, presence or what have you, you know, and this is where you can see kind of like a, 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 a doubling almost, you know, where is the second person of the Trinity? Well, in virtue of the divine nature, who is, which is omnipresent, it's everywhere, you know. Where is the second person of the Trinity also? Well, in this human body walking around for a century of Palestine. So in my view, Christ was kind of like doubly in his body. He was there in virtue of his omnipresence, but he's also there in virtue of the fact that the human nature, which is a geographically located you know, entity or a, a physical entity, spatio-temporal, uh, was located in one certain location as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, even Athanasius says something similar to that. Um, I'm glad I agree with Athanasius. Yes. Uh, at least on the, the omnipresence and local presence simultaneously. Mm -hmm. um, so one thing that, that I noted in my conversation with Sockold is that in transubstantiation, there's often like the deception question, right? Like, you know, for, for someone who holds a very real, um, you know, sense of the change, you know, why can't you look at it under a microscope? And some people have said like, well, it maybe changes back or it hides itself or you're just looking at the accidents or something like that. And there's almost a deception question, yeah. right? Um, and, and there's, I feel like something when it comes to the Jesus saying, uh, no one knows the day or the hour except the Father, um, I would I would also a point out that the Holy Spirit doesn't seem to get to know either, but that um, but that it would seem weird. It would seem like Jesus would be lying if he had some other capacity or sense in which he did know. Well, I guess it seems to me that a lot of the things that Christ does or says or what have you have to be kind of like keyed up to a certain nature, and that it's important to like um, I don't know, get clear on who is the who or what is the terminus for the predication in place here um you know to say that um uh, the divine word is spatially located is an apt statement but you've got to kind of like modify that by saying qua his human nature if you were to say the divine word is spatially located qua his divine nature 
that would be false according to the spirituality or the non-bodiliness, the incorporeality of divine persons. Mm -hmm. So that, I mean, I think that qua move kind of helps us at times, you know, who was on the cross? Well, the divine word was, Christ was. Also the human nature of Christ was, the divine nature was not because the divine nature can't, isn't the kind of thing you can nail to a cross. Again, it's incorporeal, you know, it can't taste things or what have you. Right. Jesus ate the broiled fish. Uh, did he do that cause divine nature or cause human nature? I think cause human nature because, you know, humans have mouths and esophagus and what have you. And so you can eat broiled fish that way post uh, resurrection and what have you. Right. But, I think, and, but again, I think you right. get these double uh, predications as well, too. You know, Jesus loved John the Baptist. Jesus loved his mother Mary. Right. Well, qua human or qua divine? Well, I think both in those situations. He humanly loved John and he divinely loved John. Um, and so sometimes we can, we can get those kind of things, but so I guess, you know, the Christological predications do get kind of tricky at times. Um, anyway, and that's maybe tangential. No, no, I, I, I think that is really relevant. I think that we can get that, that this will eventually tie back to the Eucharist too, mm. is that it seems, it, it seems what you're saying is okay. So long as one, as what he's doing is not, it could be true of one nature, but not the other true of both simultaneously, so long as it's not incompatible with one or the other. That, that seems fine, because we don't have, we don't have two who's, right? We've got one who, right? One person, but we have, and natures seemingly in this link, in this way of talking are what, right? You know, a nature is a what. The, the human nature isn't a who and the divine nature isn't a who because that would be too Nestorian, I think. Um, but it would seemingly not be able to be true that something could be true qua human nature that was incompatible with divine nature because then there's some sort of logical contradiction in terms of when it comes to what's true of the person. Well, but I think we get those kinds of predications like all over the councils. I mean, and so my, my friend Tim Paul's written a two part book, maybe two, uh, two books, two part series. I don't know. In defense of, of conciliar Christology and in defense mm -hmm. of extended conciliar Christology this is Oxford um, University Press. And, you know, he points out that there are just like blatant contradictions going on all over the, 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 the councils. You know, the immortal is mortal. You know, mm -hmm. the incorporeal is corporeal. Um, you know, the, Im, the, you know all, the, the infinite is finite, like just blatant contradictions. And, you know, he's like, well, are they, are they insane? Do they not know how logic works? Is, and his whole point is like just teasing out like, well, no, when you have a two natured entity, you can end up with these predications that on the surface seem blatantly contradictory, but you've got to revise it or what he thinks, you know, the fathers were doing is implicitly sort of tacitly saying that when you have a predication like that, you mean has a nature such that. So, you know, Jesus, uh, you know, the divine word, Jesus Christ is immortal and mortal. Okay, that's obviously contradictory. What does that mean? Jesus Christ has a nature such that he is immortal. Jesus Christ has a nature such that he is mortal, which is, which is then a true statement that, that that comes out as true because he has two natures. Now that's weird because we don't have anything else in the world that has two natures. Everything else we bump into all the times, you know, people and lions or whatever have one nature, but Christ is a special case here where you have two natures. So my, my view, I mean, so I, I, and I, I embrace that. I say, yeah, I mean, we have these blatant contradictions in, in, you know, as we do our Christology, which are not actually contradictory because of the fact that we've got two natures in play. Hmm. Okay. Well, I find that a little bit dissatisfying, but I, I see the point that, that you're trying to make. So I guess when it then circles back to the Eucharist, hmm. it, it seems like um, that is there something that couldn't be, that would be mutually contradictory about sort of the two, well, so I guess how, it, in the example of the incarnation that you're giving, right, there's the one person, right, that is sort of the, has the two natures that are connecting to it. What is the one thing that has both bread and has both body or has yeah. both wine and has both blood? Yeah. So there's where it's a little bit, um, it's a good point because it's, it's a fine grained distinction between the two incarnation and Eucharist in this situation, because like 
the one thing here you might call, I mean, I don't like to use the word supposit because it's got all kinds of like medieval, you know, baggage to it. But the one subject you might say of the predications is actually the body of Christ. So mm-hmm. the body of Christ actually functions as like the subject as well as the predicate in that sort of sentence. Now we don't say the body of Christ is the body of Christ. Like that's, you know, that's just a tautology and that doesn't make any sense. Mm-hmm. But that is how kind of how it goes. So if you're mapping the Christological predications and the Eucharistic predications, you could say the divine word is God, the divine word is a human. In the Eucharistic situation, you'd say the body of Christ is the body of Christ and the body of Christ is a piece of bread. Now, that predication in that situation in there is what I call a, a synecdoche, so or what I term a synecdoche, uh, picking up from some Lutheran sort of terminology as well there. So it's where you refer to the, you refer to the part by the name of the whole, you know, so, uh, and I mean, a simple illustration here, you know, um, I, I could say, this is my body, and I'm like referring to my whole body, right? Mm-hmm. I can also say, this is my body, you know, I, I'm I'm using the whole as a reference for the part. Yeah. Okay? Yeah. So this is this is my forearm here or whatever, you know, this is my elbow. Yes, yeah. I can use this more specific predication at times. And it's false to say, um, this is my knee. That's a false predication. But it's true to say this is my body. Right, right, it's right. It's no more true to say, you know, this is my body, because my torso is bigger than my elbow, or whatever, but I can say this is my body of these various parts. That's what I think is going on there in the Eucharistic predication. That object there, the bread, is the body. It takes the name of the whole, even though it's just a part. Right. So that's why, you know, more than one person can take the Eucharist at once, or in a certain sense, uh, it, is that it's not, it's not like they're duplicating Christ bodies um, to, uh, to, for every single person participating in communion all over planet Earth. I mean, I like to say it's it's Christ extending his body. So that's yeah. where the, the you know, that's the, the the extended mind literature that I kind of dip into there in the philosophy of mind. That our bodies can be extended by means of our immediate action with physical objects in a manner as such that those objects then can be incorporated into our bodies. Now again, that's a little bit of like an intuition pump there. I'm not quite sure that one needs to take on the whole extended mind literature in order to like buy that. But I think that there is some points of contact, both with kind of Christological explications having to do with instrumental action and how it is that the the human nature is incorporated into the divine person by means of instrumentality. Um, That is likewise going on in the philosophy of mind literature that I also then want to appropriate in the Eucharistic conversation as well. Mm -hmm. So the bread and the wine become instruments of Christ's body. They become an extension of his body. I even say they kind of become like prosthetic devices of his body Um, in a a similar way, more an an analogy, but in a similar way that if, you know, my my arm were to get cut off in some farming accident, we're here in the Midwest, right? Um, I could uh, could have a a prosthetic device put onto my arm here or put onto where my arm once was, let's say, and that would extend my body to include this, this prosthetic device. And maybe the prosthetic device is like an inch longer than my original body was. And so I get, you know, extended even further than it once was or, or what have you. By means of my exercising my, um, my agency through that object, that object then becomes incorporated into my body such that it becomes true, or as I think becomes apt to say, this prosthetic device is my body. Mm-hmm. Sure. Sure, that makes sense. Um, I I guess I, I'll I'll shift gears a little bit because another sure. question and another topic that I feel like is also very interesting and also probably somewhat neglected by Protestants, especially evangelicals, is what is required to make this change happen. Right, mm-hmm. I guess on behalf of the church or the Christian body that participates in it. Yeah. Right, because in First Corinthians there seems to be pretty clear warnings that if this isn't done properly, that the results could be hazardous or even deadly. Mm -hmm. Um, So suggesting that there is a right way and many wrong ways to do this. So how uh, could you explain a little bit about how you understand what's sort of necessary to cause this to happen when Christians, uh, you know, partake? Um, So what is necessary is that Christ chooses to act with that particular object, Mm -hmm. simply put there. 
that's what's necessary. And so there's no conjuring up of Christ. There's no magic involved. There's no incantations that like forces Christ to move or whatever or what have you. So it's all about Christ's agency uh, using these objects as his body for his purposes. Now, what I think we get in scripture and in the tradition are, um, you know, um, things we need to have faith in that Christ will do that when we do, you know, when we, we match our patterns, we match our actions to the biblical pattern. So, you know, we have faith that when we take, you know, the bread and the wine and we do the words of institution and we kind of follow the biblical pattern, et cetera, et cetera, that Christ is going to show up. I don't think we have like a guarantee because I think Christ is free to show up when and where he wants to. I think we have pretty good assurances that Christ is going to show up in his instances of our exercising our faith and, you know, in, especially in an ecclesial community and that sort of thing. Um, but all that's necessary is for Christ to act, Christ to operate on, on his own. And he, you know, he might be doing that in all kinds of places we have no indication of, but again, but we have no indication of that. So, right. you know, so we try to fit our patterns to the biblical fat patterns and as has, I think, as mediated through the traditions reading of those, um, those biblical patterns as well. Mm -hmm. So that's to say, I, I, so I shy away in the book from like having a theory of ordination or a theory of like, you know, apostolic succession or a particular kind of ecclesiology that's, requ that's a requisite for these things to happen. Um, Cause that for me at least was like, straying from like the main point of what I was trying to do in this book, but also because um, I think that's a whole other area of study, you know, what's going on with Christ's presence in the Eucharist, places I've articulated it, again, is about what Christ wants to do with the things that he, I think, has said he's going to do them with. Um, what other kinds of things are the considerations for bringing that about? I, I think those are not necessary, but they might be prudential, um, they might be fitting, they might be appropriate, but what is necessary is, is Christ and Christ's action. Mm -hmm. So, and that, that, this is the question that I think helps understand why it was such a big deal in the Protestant Reformation, yep. was how uh, Eucharistic theology plugged into ecclesiology, right? right? And that's where yep. you can really understand why you know, uh, th there was literal bloodshed over mm -hmm. the topic yeah. because it quickly connects to the question of whose authority, what authority, what gives someone authority but not someone else, and, mm -hmm. and those sort of things. Mm -hmm. So you're taking a pretty ecumenical um, tact on that one by uh, leaving it all on Jesus and, <laughs> and, and, and not giving too many strict qualifications on, on anything other than that. Well, yeah, it, it could be ecumenical, um, uh, but I, I think it's also, I mean, I, I guess I'm just trying to make a modest proposal, yeah. um, and I was trying to focus on a specific issue, and at least as I was articulating things here in the book on what needs to happen in order for the, the thing to happen that I think Christ is saying when, when he says, this is my body, um, you know, I don't think Christ needs like, you know, a, a priest in apostolic succession. I don't think he needs the church. I don't, you know, he, he, he's Christ. He's, you know, the divine, he's the God man here. You know, he can do, um, you know, he, he can do what he wishes with, with his body and show up where he, where he wants to. That's what's required. Mm -hmm. And again, I think we have these patterns that testify to that or that give us an object of faith to having that and we can trust in God's promises and et cetera, et cetera. But those are not necessary things. You know, those, those are not things that God must do, let's say, by any kind of, you know, logical necessity or, or what have you. Um, so, so I think that that should give us a bit of like modesty in these kind of like ecumenical conversations, at least I might yeah. hope. Mm -hmm. It also means that I think this view could be <laughs> appropriated by a, whole, a wide range of sure. denominational, um, you know, traditions. Um, you know, I think the Roman Catholics could not sign up for something like this. Um, I think that there's very much, you know, Lutheran flavor going on in here. And so it might be a bit more specific than Lutherans like to talk about, but I think they could get on board with it. As I put in the book too, I think there's a lot of dovetail with Orthodox theology. And the Orthodox themselves, from the ones I know, don't like to get, you know, like the Lutherans, don't like to get too metaphysically specific. Yeah, it's, it's interesting that they've never fought over this either, right? But they they, yeah, they had their iconoclasm never. battles. Not well. I, I, not that I'm aware of. It maybe maybe you know something that that I, I'm missing out on. But as far as I know, the Eastern Orthodox have have never really 
had these sorts of intra, you know, traditional fights. I don't know orthodoxy that well, um, but uh, it, it seems as though they've, uh, from the orthodox theology and history that I know, they've had a fight about everything. They just haven't necessarily broken too much, mm. too often as maybe Protestants have. Although there are, you know, schisms going on in orthodoxy are, as yeah. well on calendar issues and other kinds of, you know, geopolitical issues uh, and the like uh, also. Um, but that is to say they haven't um, tended to, uh, certainly not in any kind of like catechetical or confessional or conciliar statements uh, gotten as specific as say Roman Catholics have or you know other even Protestant denominations have in their confessions of faith that you like must sign on to. Um, what I was trying to say though is that I think the view I articulate here does have some points of contact with some orthodox sensibilities uh, mm -hmm. of using the incarnation as an explanatory motif and as like a, a you know underlying uh, infrastructure for talking about the Eucharist. Um, I think there are clear Anglican points of contact as well. Anglicanism itself has kind of a, a wide, you know, it's got its own spectrum of belief on the Eucharistic presence, um, but there are certainly some ways that this could be harmonious with broadly Anglican views. And I think even when one gets to like reformed um, views as well, there are, there are not too many things one would have to kind of like, um, I don't know, squint at, so to speak, in order to like be faithful to some of the reform confessions and, and still kind of take this on board also. And then finally, I mean, evangelicals tend to not make confessions about this kind of thing. Yeah. You know, it's just, you know, they just want to make sure, like, again, take the ESCA statement of faith for, for Ted's, um, you know, they just want to make sure that you don't have to require the Lord's Supper as like a, a point of salvation. Like you must participate in the Lord's Supper in order to be saved. Like, I'm not saying that at all, but in terms of like the metaphysics or whatever, there's nothing about that at all in there. There's a whole, whole you know, whatever, you know, kind of like a whole range of views could be on offer and, and, and fit with that particular evangelical statement of faith. So this is where I, you know, want to say like, hey, like, come check out this view here. You don't have to be strictly bifurcating, you know, your, your conception of the Eucharistic presence here. Here's a view that's like, you know, ecumenically savvy, I think. It's with, you know, got Protestant dovetails and, and touch points and, and the like, and might be a little bit more um, satisfactory than, you know, one extreme that you think you, you have to, uh, you know, choose between. Yeah, yeah. Well, well, that, that makes good sense. And I, I do think that you accomplish a lot of those missions. Mm, um, thanks. So... Uh, you, you talked a fair amount about dominical words and sort of speech act theory I did. for a while. Yeah. Um, and I, I guess maybe if you could explain to the listeners, what, what, how, do you, how did you uh, connect um, sort of, you know, philosophy of language in with how uh, the Eucharist should be understood? Um, yeah, sure. Well, um, I think in thinking about the words of institution, the divinical words, this is my body, this is my blood. Um, I was kind of thinking about, well, what do those words mean? Mm -hmm. and, and how are we to understand them? And I, I think I'm sympathetic to the speech act theorists perspective that, um, uh, you know, words don't really mean anything outside of a sentence that's being uttered, you know, written, uttered in a, in a broad sense by some speaker. Um, and so really, what are sentences about? What are words about? Well, it's about what someone is doing with their words. That was J.L. Austin's book, How to Do Things with Words. And that's the simple, I think, observation that, excuse me, we, we do uh, a lot of actions with our words. We're not always just simply, you know, describing something. Right. Um, it's, it's not just log logical positivism all the way down. Exactly. Yeah, right. And so, and so what are those kinds of things that one can do and one does do with their, uh, with their words? And so, uh, you know, so I, I, I linked that up to different kinds of things like, uh, you know, like a consecration, you know, bringing it about that this object is then owned by God in a, in a special way. Um, renaming. I also articulated the, the, the words of institution as a renaming. So Christ is adding another name, giving a name, maybe kind of in a Kripkean sense, kind of baptizing this object with another name. A christening might be more apt, I suppose. Right. Baptizing I think is the word that Kripke used. Um, and, uh, and, uh, and, and therefore, Christ is not just, uh, not just saying simply in a, in a simple predication, this is my body, um, but he's also 
consecrating and there and also then renaming this particular object in a in a robust sense that then gives he, way to just, an assertive yeah he's not just describing the truth he's making the truth by speaking it that's the the exercitive um elocutionary mm -hmm. act to use uh, william alston's terminology who is who i kind of dialogue with in in the book uh it's a bringing into being a certain state of affairs Alston's kind of like standard illustration is something like, uh, you know, uh, the, the minister says, you know, I now present to you, you know, I now pronounce you man and wife or, or something like that. Or, you know, you're going for a job interview and, 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 you know, the boss says, oh, you're hired, you know, or the, you know, you slide into home plate and the umpire calls, you're out. It's like right. those sentences there, those sentences bring about a certain state of affairs um, in the world. Um, and I think a consecration is also one of those kinds of things. And a renaming is also, it's bringing about a certain state of affairs right. in the world. But, but then that sort of connects back to the ecclesial question, right? Because yep. oftentimes people are able to do those sorts of declarative acts mm -hmm. by virtue of some sort of power or position or role that they hold, right? A police officer can say, I'm placing you under arrest, but yeah. I can't say I'm placing you under arrest, right? right? And the Supreme Court justice can, you know, um, uh, have a president take an oath of office, but I can't have a president, I can't give an mm -hmm. oath a, a, of office to a president yeah. um, and, and those sorts of things. So we have like sort of those, you know, secular often connected with government, but you could mm -hmm. imagine a club right? The president of a club, I declared this meeting in order or something like that. Um, or like in baseball, right? You know, I mean, or in baseball, you know, yeah, the, the first base coach can't say he's safe. You right. Know? No, it's the umpire has to say he's safe. Yes, exactly. Yeah. That's, that's a perfect. So, and, and again, it's by nature of the authority vested in that person. Indeed. And mm -hmm. so, so how then are we to understand the words that a pastor or a priest mm -hmm. will be saying when they begin the, the Eucharistic celebration in a church? And how does that connect with um, Jesus's own freedom to be there or not? Right, so you're pushing me on the authority question. Yes. That's, that's fine. Because I mean, I think I say this in the book, actually, like in some kind of footnote, like, like this is as close to a theory of ordination as I'm planning on getting in this book. Because I'm kind of like uh, probing the point where, there where um, in order for a, um, in order for a conventional change to take place in a linguistic community, you have to have some kind of authorized member of the community be the one to like bring that change about. You know, so let's say, you know, I got a group of buddies or something like that. We're a linguistic community and I'm like, hey, you know, we're not gonna call this a high five anymore. We're gonna call it a high 10, even though it's one handed. And they're all like, oh yeah, that's cool. We're gonna do that, whatever. We're, we're just, we're, we're weirdos and that sort of thing. And so like by the power vested in me, by this linguistic community, I can like change a linguistic convention. So too then with something like this, you know, you have to have an authorized member of the linguistic community in order to bring about that kind of a, that kind of a change. Now that's the groundwork for a theory of ordination, you might say. Mm -hmm. I think, however, um, at least my own view on this right now, it, it, is that that is a uh, upstream enough or malleable enough sort of theory that that could be played out in various other places where there are other ecclesiological concerns. Right. So if you had a congregational model of church government, let's say, where the congregation elects a member of their own, per se, to be the leader of that congregation, to be the authorized member of that congregation, then that linguistic community, you know, the First Baptist Church of wherever, um, is going to then endow that individual with that particular power to change linguistic conventions within that church. You know? So if that minister says, hey, this object right here, this is the body of Christ, um, that congregation could, that linguistic community could take that on board as the authorized member has, has said so. You might blow that into a larger kind of conception and say, well, you know, the, the linguistic community is the Roman Catholic Church, let's say. And so that linguistic community has more of a, a uh, maybe not more of a, a structure, but just like a, a larger structure or infrastructure even for designating certain authorized members of the community who can say certain words in certain contexts in order to bring that, uh, in order to bring changes about in that linguistic community. So if both the Roman Catholic and the Congregationalist 
can appropriate a, theory, a linguistic theory like this, then I think all the way in between too, can other sort of traditions appropriate that kind of a view as well. But it's, you're gonna need to like import in further, um, what I would say ecclesiological concerns based upon who is authorized members and who can like, uh, how, mm -hmm. uh, how, a linguistic con how a linguistic community could actually function, would actually function sure. given other things. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so I, I, I can see why you would want to stop there on that subject, um, <laughs> because a, a, any, any more specific than that, and you'll start splitting different denominations by their understanding of ecclesiology. Yeah, well, see, it just wasn't uh, the point of the book, Yeah. Um, you know, and so uh, maybe this is a second book I'll need to write or a third book or, you know, maybe this is down the road and I'll, I want to I'll get more specific on that kind of that kind of uh, consideration right. there. But I think in terms of the issue I was focused in on, Christ's presence in the Eucharist, um, uh, I still contend that this would be something that could be applicable to a wide range of views. And then yeah. how you cash that out in your own kind of nuanced fashion would be importing in other considerations that were just kind of outside the purview of this book. Right. And I think you're right to not um, correlate together things that need not be, right? And I think the specific work that you were trying to focus on doesn't require a specific ecclesiology. I, th I think you're right that, that you could have gone more into that, but you would have been at the same time perhaps doing something else that wasn't as jointly connected or necessarily connected with the main thrust of your focus. Yeah, and I guess that, I mean, I don't know if, I, it's not that I wanna, see, I don't, it's not that I see theology as hermetically sealed off. Like all these doctrines are like, you know, only able, you can only talk about one doctrine at a time. Like, I don't think that's the case at all. I mean, I think theology is very much interrelated and it's a great big messy milieu and that sort of thing. And we look at things from different angles and that's, you know, one mm -hmm. of the exciting things about theology is it is so connected. It's part of the reason why I'm, I'm a systematic theologian because I just, you know, see implications across the board with all these various loci. Yeah. At the same time, I do think we run into theological confusion when we start, you know, getting mixed up about what the focus of our particular conversation is. And we start having a disagreement about this, I don't know, topic, whatever it is, topic X, but really it's topics Z and J and R that are the ones that we're disputing on, but those are getting mixed up in here. And so we get yeah. all confused and, you know, and then it ends up not being a productive conversation. So in so much as everything is connected, I think it's still helpful to have very narrow, specific conversations at times in order to get clear on this particular area before we then move on to somewhere else um, without bringing along further confusion and, and you know, fuzzying of the, of the lines of conversation into those other domains. Sure, you could imagine it like working on a car or something like that, sure. right? The car needs all the pieces to operate. But that doesn't mean that you can't change out the brakes with, uh, without leaving the engine alone or the transmission or whatever or something like that. Yeah. But nevertheless, they still are interconnected at times and, and things like that. Yeah, that, that's, that's a good point. Yeah, I mean, your car could be veering to the right, you know, and, um, you know, it might be that your alignment's off and your tires are worn down and your brakes are bad or what have you. But like, you know, sometimes you just got to go in there and work on the alignment. And that's the mm -hmm. one thing we're trying to get in place. And that's not going to solve the entire problem. Just like a book on Christ's presence, it's not going to solve every theological issue. But if you're just like, oh, the tires, the tires, the tires, the tires, the tires, well, you know, you're not going to address the veering off to the right because the alignment's bad and the brakes are bad and what have you. So mm -hmm. this is just kind of one component of trying to, uh, you know, uh, address what is, you know, multifaceted God, which yeah. is all of theology, you know, it's, it's all kind of interconnected in that way. Sure. So uh, we've already we've already spent we've already been talking. I think for over an hour and a half now. I, I warned you that these things go by pretty quickly. Um, that is are, theology, I suppose. <laughs> are there are there any other things that that you want to say or that you want to talk about, or if you have any questions for me? Um, I well, I will ask this. So as a non-trinitarian, I'm kind of curious here. I'm just trying to like get in my my head space, your head space a little bit there and thinking about a non-incarnational or maybe differently incarnational kind of way of thinking about Christology and whether or not a view like this could actually work. Um, mm -hmm. And that's something we analytic theologians, you know, if I call myself that, those who like analytic theology uh, like to do, which is kind of like, well, if I can get into this head space, how does this, you know, how does this perspective right. actually flow? So, and, yeah. And so, so, I guess in a weird sense, it could, mm -hmm. but I just wouldn't call it incarnational, 
right? Okay. Okay. I, I could say a dual natured, you know, uh, substantive view of the Eucharist or something like mm -hmm. that, mm -hmm. that I don't think is a useful parallel for understanding who Jesus was, right? Mm -hmm. But that doesn't mean that it doesn't work over here in the Eucharist, right? Mm. I, I could do something like that. I see. Um, yeah, yeah. And, and I'm not sure, kind of like what we just said about cars, you know, we need not connect things, you know, just because I don't think it, you know, the brakes should work this way doesn't mean that I don't think the suspension could work that way either. Um, so do you, do you think the incarnation is not possible or just not actual? I have not heard a theory of the incarnation that really makes sense to me, if I'm honest. So I will not categorically say that I'm convinced that it's possible, but I'm yet to be convinced that it's possible. But I think wait, so you, really- so wait, 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 But you're also not convinced it's impossible? I, I'm not sure if I could give a lockdown proof of why such a thing could not happen. Mm -hmm. I don't think that it was on the table of theological possibilities in Ju first century Judaism that Jesus was working in. And I don't think at the end of the day, it's what scripture teaches, mm -hmm. which is really my main, main concern. Mm -hmm. But you I, don't think it's, you don't right now, you're not convinced right now that it's metaphysically or logically impossible for one person to have two natures. I, I suppose not, okay. but I think that there are things, yeah, that's a good question. So one, it, one thing that I don't like about the incarnation is that I generally think that persons need to belong to a kind, right? And what it seems like in, in incarnational theology is that kinds belong to a person, whereas persons, I feel like, belong to a kind. Hmm. Why do you think that? I guess, I don't know, it just seems intuitively true. Like, the thing that you said that, honestly, that ruffled my feathers the most, although I, I didn't uh, speak up at the moment, was when you said that Jesus was not a human person. Yeah. Right? And, and that just doesn't seem right to me. Like, I don't see how you could be, you know, my, like, in all ways he was like unto us except for sin right and not be a human person i don't see how he could be my brother or sister and and or i could be his brother so right he can't yeah. be my sister you know what i'm sure. saying yeah um without him being that that would seem to be something that he wasn't that i was mm -hmm. so now it seems to me that there is there uh there are ways of carefully saying that christ um was a human person the worry is the Nestorian worry, because it's just like really close right there. I think if I'm, ah, this, is, this might get me in trouble, but I think Ian McFarland's recent book, is it the word, in, no, the, his recent book on, on the incarnation, whatever the title is, I, I thought I recall him saying something there that there's like a way of, of saying Christ is a human person. But as long as you like have in your mind, okay, you don't mean two persons and, and what have you. If you mean person as in like, you know, a member of a certain kind, or the holder of a certain kind of nature, um, then that would be a legitimate way of talking about Christ. And also that you wouldn't like deny his divine personhood also. So the problem, you know, every time you have two persons, then you, you've got Nestorianism and you've got, you know, right, right. splitting the bifurcating of, of, the, of, of the natures and, and that sort of a thing. But if you just mean it as like a qualification or something like that, or as membership in a kind, there, that might be, that might be, there might be a way mm. of being orthodox about, by that. So, so that, so that's one concern, right? And then I, I also think that there are just perhaps some non, I, I'm just not sure if the overlap between humanity and divinity can ever really work that way, hmm. right? I, I just think that really, to me, when it sounds like you're saying Jesus is human and divine, you're saying Jesus is human and or divine. Right. And Wait, or, why would I say or? Well, like, because, like, the way that he could not know something, right? Jesus, like, if Jesus knew something and didn't know something, right, you're sort of allowing knowing to be down inside the natures and not at the level of person. Or Isn't that where it like is? That. I think that, 
you see, this is weird. I guess then to me, person seems like center of consciousness or something like that in terms of what I mean when I say person. So, but isn't it isn't it the nature that endows a person with the ability to do certain kinds of things? Yes, right. So a person and, doesn't a person doesn't know in their personhood. <laughs> you know, they know in virtue of their capacity for knowledge, which is given them by their nature. Well, I would say that the, well, hmm. so I would say it is the person that knows. Yeah, but not all types of persons can know. Right, like a I don't know a slug person, you know a can't a slug a slug person can't think you know high abstract mathematical thoughts. Wait, what's a slug person? Is this some kind of like just a slug? Is this like I mean Spider-Man? a slug. Sorry, oh, no. Mean, okay, it's just, just I, a slug. I just mean a slug. A per- well, so what do you mean by person? Well, so by person, I I, I mean a person could be I, by person. I don't mean human being. Right, a human person is a, t- a person that is a human. Right there, uh, a dog in a certain sense is a person, but ah. it is not a human. Right. So, so when I when I think about this, I tend to use the word hypostasis. Sure. To refer to any any individual instance of a nature. Yeah. So you know, I've got a dog. His name is Bean. He's a hypostasis of canine nature. You yeah. know, I'm a human being. I'm a hypostasis of human nature. And then I take the Boethian definition that says a person is any individual instance. Uh, I think he says any substance, but I think that's kind of a little bit tricky. So it's a Boethian-like uh, definition. Mm-hmm. Any, vid- any individual instance of a rational nature is a person. Mm-hmm. At which point, you know, then you have humans, uh, you've got God, you've got, you know, maybe Chewbacca or Yoda. Or these, are, these are rational yeah, or natures. Or a robot, yeah. Yeah. Well, I don't know about a robot necessarily, but maybe, maybe if, if you, mm. uh, rationality is certainly construed. So those are persons. So persons, on my view, is kind of like a, 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 a certain kind or a certain class of hypostases of which, you know, there is sure. slug A and slug B are different hypostases of slug nature or, you know, canine nature or bovine right. nature for cows or what have you. Interesting. That's so what I take person. Right. And so I'm saying person to mean something that's alive, right? I wouldn't say a rock person, right? But a rock is a hypothesis of rock nature. Uh, a tree is a hypothesis of tree nature. But even slugs probably have something of what it's like to be a slug. Sure. Uh, a bat has something of what it's like to be a bat. Yeah. And, and those sorts of things. Mm-hmm. So, so I, I, if I use center of consciousness as my definition of person, uh, then it is what kind of person that you are that affords you the abilities or limitations that you have, right? Which is why a human person can do calculus, but a slug person can't do calculus. So, but you say it's what kind of person? Yes. Right? But doesn't that mean what nature that person possesses? Yes. But it's not the nature that is doing the thinking, it is the person that's doing the thinking. But isn't it by means of the nature? Um... I'm not like sure a, sl- it... a slug doesn't have rationality as a component part of its nature. It's not a part of its capacity. So right. that, pers- that person can't think, <laughs> you know, rationally. Um, but a human person has that as a component part of their nature. And so for- therefore they can think. But it's not their nature that's thinking, right? No, it's, like... it's them. Yeah, the, the person right. is the subject of the predication. You know, James Arcadi thinks. Or, you know, James Arcadi thinks about having a cup of tea in a couple minutes here. Um, yeah. You know, that, that, that's, that's a, a thought there. So it's the person that's doing it, but it's because of my nature that I am able to do that. I'm able to be yes. the subject of that sentence. Right. Yes, yes. I think I agree with that. Because if it, if it were the nature that we're doing the thinking, then there would seemingly be one human mind, right? Or something yeah, like that. Sure. Or you'd and have kind of, uh, uh, yeah, you'd have odd, well, and there have been philosophers that thought that way. Yeah, and depending but, <laughs> on your view of what a nature is also. So, I mean, yeah, but yeah. I would kind of shy away from that. Right. And so, so that's why the thinking is in the person, but the nature is what affords and limits the sort of thinking that the, the person is capable of. Yeah. And, and so that's why it seems to me why it would be a mistake to try and locate Jesus's knowledge or lack of knowledge of a certain thing within the the nature it is well in the person well i guess uh, let's not think of 
the situation is like a knowledge is some kind of like bit. Let's think about it more about like uh, the capacity for action, the capacity to do something. Mm -hmm. So um, again, I have the capacity, the ability given me by my nature, you know, to to move my arms around or what have you, or go make a cup of tea and taste that sort of a, that that tea, what have you. Um, or I can or I can do you know think about two plus two equals four, which the slug can't can't do. Mm -hmm. Why does it seem like it's kind of, uh, does it seem to you contradictory then that the uh, the divine word can have, let's say the divine word, you know, a person um, can have two sets of those, even ones that have distinctions between them? Sure. So, it, I, I'm, I'm, I suppose that I don't have a hard and fast reason why that's impossible mm -hmm. why it couldn't be well i don't know there i don't have any i i can't give an argument for it i guess it's just yeah. something almost like an axiomatic intuition that it seems like a person belongs to a category and that's a one-to-one -one map and, and that it it and that's what makes it the type of person that it is. And a two-typed person seems, I don't know, uh, it just a, it's something like ontologically extravagant or, or something like that. Yeah, I mean, I guess I might invite you to examine that intuition a bit. <laughs> and sure. I'm sure you do and, and have and that mm -hmm. sort of thing. And maybe ontologically extravagant is the case. Mm -hmm. And of course, then the early church is going to say like, yeah, but we got a really dire situation that calls for an ontologically extravagant you know, uh, solution. Mm -hmm. Um, but you also might check out uh, you know, Timothy Paul's book, and I think that might you know, provide a little bit more, I don't know, grist for your mill uh, on this issue if you're kind of interested in, in pursuing it. Because I think he does a lot of good work in terms of trying to avoid this sort of contradictory sort of like situation that one might find themselves in if they kind of took your uh, you know, categorization the way that, that you did. But that might be a conversation for him for another day. Yeah. He's a great guy to talk with if you want to have him on the, on, the, on the show. Well, I appreciate I always appreciate good references and good connections for future people to talk to. Yeah, uh, tell him is, I sent you. All right, I will, which is uh, how I got connected to you. So I guess, you know, we're probably getting close to maybe a good time limit on this. Um, are, are there any other last things that you wanted to say? No, this was great. It was a lot of fun to chat about this stuff, and I appreciate the opportunity. Yeah, well, I appreciate it, James. Thank you for, for being generous with your time. Uh, and, you know, thank you for writing books like the one that you wrote and uh, giving uh, people like me something to think about and something to learn from. Yeah, well, great. Thanks so much. I appreciate you reading it. Sure. All right. I will stop the recording right there.